All right, welcome. On behalf of the Mayo Clinic School of Continuous Professional Development, I'd like to welcome you to Mayo Clinic's COVID-19 live webinar series. I'm Dr. William Palmer, Associate Dean of the School, and your host for today's webinar entitled Updates on COVID-19 Variants of Concern, Vaccines, and Long Haulers. This webinar is accredited for one AMA PRA Category 1 credit, and a record of attendance will be provided for all other healthcare professionals. This webinar is supported by an educational grant from Pfizer. Here are the associated disclosures for this activity. Before we get started, I'll cover a few points. The first is how to claim credit. If you'd like to claim credit after the webinar, please visit ce.mayo.edu forward slash COVID-0111. You'll need to log into the site, and if this is your first time visiting, you'll need to create an account profile. After you've done this and logged in, you will be able to access the course, complete a short evaluation, and then you'll have the ability to download or save your certificate. This link will be dropped into the chat box throughout today's webinar. The second item is how we'll be facilitating questions. You'll see at the bottom of the screen the chat and Q&A functions. If you have any questions during today's webinar for our presenters, it's important that you drop them into the Q&A channel. There's also a helpful upvote button, so be sure to upvote the questions that you would like to see answered. Here are today's learning objectives, which will be covered throughout the webinar. Review variants of concern in the US and globally, including Omicron. Compare the Delta and Omicron variants and transmissibility, infectivity, and clinical manifestations. Update the effectiveness of the COVID vaccines against Omicron variant. Review prevalence, clinical presentation, and distinguished characteristics of long haulers of COVID. And update the management of long-term complications of COVID. With that, I'd like to introduce today's moderator, our own Dr. Claudia Libertine. Dr. Libertine is an infectious disease specialist, certified, certified physician executive, and licensed professional coach. As professor of medicine with over 100 peer-reviewed publications, she has led the COVID service in multiple clinical research trials at Mayo Clinic in Florida. She graduated from the University of Toledo Medical School and completed internal medicine, infectious disease, and medical microbiology training at Mayo Clinic in Rochester. So with that, I'd like to turn things over to Dr. Libertine to introduce today's panelists. Claudia. Thank you, Dr. Palmer. And thank you everybody for being with us today on this webinar. We at Mayo Clinic first want to extend our gratitude to you for the care and dedication that you render to our patients and colleagues on a daily basis. We have fantastic presentations from two of my highly respected colleagues. The first, um, session will be by Dr. Isabel Mira, who completed medical school in Columbia, where she completed an internal medicine residency program at the University of Antioquia. After moving to United States, she completed a second internal medicine residency program at University Hospitals at Case Western Reserve University in Cleveland, Ohio. A pulmonary and critical care fellowship followed, which she completed at the Cleveland Clinic in Ohio. She then became one of our colleagues here as a consultant at Mayo Clinic Florida from 2012 to 2020, where she was co-director of the Pulmonary Rheumatology Clinic and created our interstitial lung disease program. In July of 2020, she joined the University of Texas McGovern Medical School in the Department of Pulmonary and Critical Care. She is an Associate Professor of Medicine. Importantly, she is the co-director of the Interstitial Lung Disease Clinic there and director of the Center of Excellence for Care of Patients with Post-COVID Disease. She will be discussing long COVID. Our next distinguished um, colleague of mine is Dr. Abhinash Virk. She is a professor of medicine at the Mayo Clinic College of Medicine and Science and a consultant in the Division of Infectious Disease in Rochester since 1997. Currently, she is co-chair of the COVID-19 Vaccine Allocation and Distribution Workgroup at Mayo Clinic. 
She is a physician chair of the Mayo Clinic Enterprise Antimicrobial Stewardship Program and Outpatient Parenteral Antimicrobial Therapy Program. Previously, she served as the acting chair of the Infectious Disease Division from 2016 through 2017 and was the vice chair and practice chair from 2010 to 2016. She established the Mayo Clinic's Travel and Tropical Medicine Clinic in 1999 and directed it for over 17 years. She has been actively involved in education and internal medicine residency program and in the ID division and has received innumerable number of awards for teaching and mentorship. She serves as the educational chair and the ID fellowship program director from 2002 to 2010. She has numerous peer reviewed publications and book chapters related to her areas of interest in antimicrobial stewardship, COVID-19 vaccines, orthopedic infections, and travel and tropical medicine. Dr. Verk received her medical degree from Assam Medical College in India, graduating in the top five in her class. She completed internal medicine residency and chief residency at Prince George Medical Center in Maryland, followed by an infectious disease fellowship at Mayo Clinic. She will be discussing variants and specifically Omicron variant. So first we invite Dr. Mira to address us on long haulers COVID. Okay, thank you. Thanks for the introduction. Um, uh, it's my honor to be present during this uh, webinar. Thank you so much for the invitation. And let me share my screen. Okay, I think it's working. Um, yes, as um, we will be talking during all this time, um, let me start saying something pretty short about the, the virus that has been affecting us during the last two years. When I say affecting us, it's the whole world. As we know, this was initially detected as a, a aggressive pneumonia in a, a people from Yuhan, China, uh, back in December um, uh, 2019. And uh, later on, this was recognized as a, the SARS infection. Uh, and was uh, considered COVID-19 because the first cases were uh, diagnosed at that moment. Since then, uh, these statistics are changing and unfortunately increasing the number of deaths and affected people. But this is uh, at this point about 6 million of deaths in the whole world. Uh, but I want to concentrate on our country this, when I initially created or work on this presentation, a couple of months ago, these were the statistics. We have 45 million of cases, that's about 700,000, and then this amount of people recovered. So the last statistics are showing increased numbers. Now the deaths are almost 900,000, and then we have about 42 million people recovery. So that is the the people or the uh, thing I'm going to talk during these 20 minutes is what is going on or what is will happen basically with the people that have recovered from COVID. Uh, even before this moment, at the after the first surge, uh, we had uh, tweets and uh, I mean in the social media started talking about not only the acute episodes, but symptoms that were persistently active in patients who uh, survive or recover from a um, mild or severe COVID infection. So then the question was, we still need to learn a lot about this virus. Then publications like these ones started being around. And again, this is in, in the media, in the, in the newspapers. So then the, the, the um, term about loan holders started being common between uh, all of us. And it's all this amount of symptoms. They say, for instance, in this paper, nearly 100 symptoms for more than 100 days present after recovering from the infection. So we, I call this conference the heritage of COVID-19, and I will uh, summarize in this way. So first definition of post-COVID syndrome then how we classify the post-COVID syndrome, what pathophysiology has been recognized so far, which ones are the main risk factors, which ones are the clinical manifestations, 
and I will be a little bit concentrated on the chronic lung manifestation, the post-COVID um, ILD or lung fibrosis or post-chronic lung disease. Um, first, the definition. There are different names, but we refer to the same thing. It's post-COVID syndrome, long COVID, post-acute COVID syndrome, or the lung coolers. The time is um, still, is a, still we, we discuss exactly when to define acute and since one moment we say this is a chronic COVID process. The acute post-COVID are symptoms present in the first weeks. Which ones are those three weeks? In, especially the first four to eight weeks. This period of time between the eight to 12 weeks is probably naturally clear, but if symptoms are persistent after 12 weeks, basically three months after recovery, is when we consider the case as a chronic COVID syndrome. Now, patients who are hospitalized and are hospitalized for a long time, a long time mean more than three weeks, we consider uh, more than 12 weeks, we consider that passing that time, even they are still at the hospital or recovering, you know, they'll tag, they, all these, they are considered chronic uh, syndrome. So this, is, this graphic is trying to summarize that. Short COVID is patient that has symptoms for less than two, three weeks. Post-acute COVID goes probably until eight to 10 weeks, but chronic COVID includes those patients with past 12 weeks of symptoms. Uh, this is as well, uh, like a summarize what is happening in terms of the viral load when the patients are in this period of time. We know during these first two weeks, we have positive uh, test. Then these tests start being um, negative, but then patients start having other manifestations, especially up to the three months post-infection. Which ones are the risk factors? Definitely there is increased risk for post-COVID symptoms in patients with more severe initial disease. However, in our center of excellence for post-COVID patients, we have a lot of patients that, that were that have been um, self-referred because they were diagnosed, uh, no hospitalized, no severe disease, but they still have some symptoms. So this varies, but in general, for most of the publications, is considered higher risk in patients with more severe initial manifestations. That is correlated with the presence of more than five, five symptoms at the time of the diagnosis. And as well, related with the complicated cases, is more common in patients with uh, uh, older patients with prior uh, medical history of diabetes, hypertension, obesity, and a mental illness. Now, um, the minority ethnic groups is question mark. You know, this is a big uh, the debate, but definitely um, probably related with prior medical conditions. Um, some uh, racial groups have been affected most as we know. Uh, the risk in terms of statistics, we have about 10 to 35% of patients when they are not hospitalized, but symptoms can be persistent for patients in up to 80% of patients who require to be hospitalized at the time of the diagnosis. What is the explanation for these chronic symptoms? So there are different theories, but we say it's the direct viral toxicity. The, we know the stimulation of the inflammatory state. In fact, we think that this cytokine syndrome explain aggressive presentation in many cases. So we don't know how much of this is still explain the chronic symptomatology. There is endothelial damage and microvascular injury that as well explain some of the manifestations of the acute setting as a hypercoagulability. The maladaptation of the angiotensin converting enzyme to pathway that we know as well has significant impact in the compromise of the lung tissue. The different manifestations, if we go for rheumatologic manifestations, uh, again, it related with the production of cytokines, uh, there is this amount of patients that have developing kind of immune related conditions following COVID, or at least perhaps prior diseases uh, exacerbate or are finally diagnosed. Then there is this additional theory about the formation of a neutrophile extracellular traps of netosis that could be related with the antibody formation and at the same time with chronic inflammatory response. 
some of these patients have been documented with antiphospholipid uh, syndrome, uh, antiphospholipid antibodies, and, all, and some of them associated with the uh, hypercoagulability have been considered with antiphospholipid syndrome. The positive prevalence of ANA is up to 30% as well. So then the theory is, is really COVID induced uh, these changes or the patient where, I mean, the patient had the process and the COVID exacerbated or activated the, the, the final um, response. Other manifestations have been seen, like a hemolytic anemia. I myself treated a couple of patients with refractory severe hemolytic anemia associated with COVID. Immune thrombocytopenia, cutaneous vasculitis, or even inflammatory myositis and myalgia that are pretty classic uh, symptom on patients even with mild COVID syndrome. This multisystemic inflammatory syndrome has been even recognized as a uh, possible Kawasaki-like Kawasaki disease in, in children. It's equivalent in, 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 in adult patients as a this severe, uh, again, cytokine syndrome, as has been recognized by many physicians. And we even, in the, in the ICU, we recognize patients with cytokine syndrome where they have this kind of chalk presentation. And again, flare-up of prior diagnosed or immune diseases are common during this acute setting. Now, more in the post-COVID syndrome. What about the hematologic sequela? So we know about this endothelial damage and the hypercoagulability, but there is a disproportionate relation between the thrombotic state during the acute phase versus what happened in the chronic cases. Chronically, I mean, after 12 weeks, the risk for thrombotic events are much lower. So in fact, we don't consider needed to keep the patient on anticoagulation passing that time. Cardiovascular sequela is very common with patients, again, after 12 weeks, still to complain of some degree of chest pain. Again, prevalence about 20%. Palpitations could be present up to six months following the infection. Uh, the, we know from cardiac MRIs done in the acute setting that the, the degree of um, possible myocarditis could be up to 60%, not clinically established or, money, or, or clearly diagnosed, but if we do MRI in all patients, uh, the degree of myocarditis could be at a, uh, this, this level, pretty high. Uh, as well, there have been increased episodes of stress-induced uh, myopathy. Neuropsychiatric sequela uh, is pretty common. Um, uh, it's probably one of the more, co more common um, complaints of the patients post-COVID is um, fatigue. They complain of chronic malaise, uh, still diffuse my myalgias. Multiple um, sleep disorders have been associated uh, or present in these patients as well. And then is all this is associated with cognitive impairment. Uh, the, the famous term of brain fog is probably the more common thing we are seeing in patients post-COVID. And this will be linked with depression and anxiety. Given all these manifestations, and uh, I will be uh, honest, say that it's, it's hard to approach these patients initially. Uh, the, 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 the idea now is compar it's, it's like a, to create a different groups of syndromes on them. So when you initially see the patient, you can characterize what is the, the, the more um, the, the, the more important complaint of the patient, and then it, it try to get um, a syndrome for the patient. And in that way, you can approach better her, their care, the head of his care. So then we can um, classify as a fatigue syndrome, as the name says, prof profound fatigue. It is important in these cases, be sure you're not missing something else. Be sure there is not any other chronic uh, disease that can explain the symptoms. It uh, could be more cardiorespiratory syndrome, characterized by cough, dyspnea, chest pain, the same. Be sure you are not missing another diagnosis as, as established heart failure or coronary syndrome or something like that. The other uh, group is the neuropsychiatry uh, process, a patient that complains mostly of headache, uh, the persistent um, um, anosmia, neurocognitive difficulties, and depression. The gastrointestinal syndrome, I link this with the hepatobiliar syndrome that is, pre I'm pretty sure the, 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 the physicians uh, that are seeing this patient in the intensive care unit are familiarized. We have many patients with this 
cause um, cholestatic process when they, when they stay in the ICU or in the hospital for a long time. So we see when they, they go out uh, from the hospital, they still can deal with issues, especially from the um, cholestatic um, biliary process. The musculoskeletal syndrome is uh, characterized uh, by muscle pain, weakness, arthralgias, be sure if the patient is post ICU, this is not related with the myopathy associated with long ICU state. The thromboembolic syndrome, I already mentioned, that is rare after th three months to have acute embolic events. But if the patient had during the event, of course, it's, it's just be sure it's safe to stop anticoagulation or not. Uh, some dermatologic uh, symptoms have been as well described, like a rash, um, um, different kind of, um, kind of urticaria, urticarial symptoms, the COVID toe uh, as well, but this is more in the acute setting. The genitourinary syndromes with proteinuria, hematuria, or renal disease, and in general, the multisystemic inflammatory syndrome uh, with uh, persistent episodes of fever, GI symptoms, rash, like a more general symptomatology. Uh, talking about the lung itself, uh, I mentioned already some um, idea about the pathophysiology, but going uh, deeper, basically, there is, we know there is this damage inside the alveoli that is character or characterizes the, um, what happened in all kinds of acute respiratory distress syndrome, so ERDS, with breakdown of the endothelium and the epithelial bar, um, um, membrane. So this happens as well in prior in other ERDS that has happened in the past with uh, H1N1, for instance. But we see um, the same in, in, in COVID, but it's not clear why some of these processes are persistent. And do we see patients with severe fibrotic process just two, three weeks after the initial diagnosis of um, COVID? Um, the severity of the endothelial injury uh, can, again, um, affect the complete membrane and seems to be worse in some cases of COVID than the damage that was similar, similarly seen in patients with influenza in the past. Then, because of this lung damage, uh, we see, of course, so we explain these multiple deaths, but for the patients who survive, then we don't know yet how many of them will develop chronic fibrosis? Then these terms about how to call this chronic this lung disease are now under discussion. We say post-inflammatory pulmonary fibrosis, post-viral pulmonary fibrosis, post-viral interstitial lung disease, post-COVID interstitial lung disease, post-COVID pulmonary fibrosis. I can tell you that my fellows are asking me, Dr. Mina, really we can call ILD? Post ILD patients post COVID, six months post COVID, that are still showing abnormal findings in the CT and a normal pulmonary function test. To be honest, at this time, we are not completely sure because we don't know if we ended up having another classification um, among all the interstitial lung diseases that we already know, or uh, these patients will improve as a happened with most of, the, most of the patients post H1N1, or definitely we are dealing in one or two years with more chronic fibrosis just related with um, COVID, and then would be a, like a new class of ILD. Uh, the reason could be related, I mean, the chronic process could be related with the, uh, the angi angiotensin converting enzyme two pathway, as I mentioned, because this is downregulated and this pathway is protective for fibrosis. The increased production of the inflammatory cytokines as well. And in cases of, I mean, patients with severe disease that were on the ventilator, we had the ventilatory associated injury and the oxygen toxicity as well. So where we are, so as we mentioned, there are millions of people affected. Now, majority, if we go by statistics, majority of cases have been mild, but 10% develop severe disease. And for that group of patients, we count the millions that are as well millions that were affected and survive. And then 20% of them will eventually develop chronic lung disease. If we look at numbers by percentage, it sounds low, but if we go by the 20% of millions of patients, then we will have definitely a lot of chronic lung uh, problems in these patients. 
So they will present uh, them with chronic dyspnea, uh, decreased uh, diffusion capacity as expected for chronic uh, fibrosis or interstitial lung disease. Uh, then we are dealing with the need for supplementary oxygen therapy. And we have noticed that many of these patients um, are diagnosed with new process as a sleep apnea with the need for positive ventilatory pressure. I, the, the next three slides are showing images of patients with, uh, with COVID pneumonia and how the different, different courses we have seen. In this, this is a case of patient who uh, has severe uh, ERDS that even required ECMO for treatment and is seen later on in our clinic. You can see in the, in the, in the, uh, here in the October 20, the classic findings related with COVID that is character, characterized by patchy areas of consolidation in peripheral distribution. So this obviously was severe, affecting the whole uh, lobes in both lungs. But these peripheral distributional lesions are the ones that make you feel pretty confident that the, the diagnosis is COVID, and probably there is not anything else that is affecting the patient. These patients, uh, even after ECMO, fortunately, is doing really well, as is seen in the, in the posterior CT. And clinically, he is as well. He's even off oxygen, uh, doing really well on, during his rehabilitation. This patient, you see, is less amount of fibrosis. This is uh, December 20, when she presented initially, and we compare with six months later, and definitely the CT is better, the pulmonary function tests are better, but she was not feeling better with multiple um, general symptoms, a significant weakness, develop diabetes, falling the steroid use during the acute phase. So she's dealing with a lot of uh, different uh, symptoms, uh, despite of the fact that the lungs look better. This is a particular case that is really touching to me. I took care of this patient when she was initially admitted to the intensive care unit pregnant. Uh, the baby was born emergently because of the severe hypoxia. The baby recovered, but the mom died almost six months after being unable to leave the unit uh, with all the consequences uh, related with the low state and COVID. Um, basically, I, I really wanted to show you is the different aspects. Some patients develop severe disease and recover. Some patients' lungs are better, but they are dealing with all these additional syndromes. And as, as we know, uh, many patients die. So then how we approach the patient who comes to our clinic and we know uh, had COVID before. So first, it's important to categorize the kind of post-COVID syndrome, and that's all the different syndromes I mentioned. It's really important because there are different um, symptoms to have a multidisciplinary team. So uh, the COVID clinics that are around the country are basically formed by different specialties because it's, it's, it's necessary given the multiple manifestations of these patients. Uh, we need to start analyzing and publish the, the data that has been collected because this will be, uh, again, a long process from now, and we don't know for how many more years we will be dealing with the sequela of COVID. Now, with medications we can use, uh, I'm, I'm basically asking about antifibrotic therapy for lung diseases. There are many trials uh, now, and uh, I hope we will have some answers based on the on results of those trials. These patients as well require aggressive rehabilitation. This is the list of, of trials that have been that are now running uh, in University of Texas. When I am, we are one of the sites for the Bio 300. Uh, that is one of the antifibrotics that we are um, uh, analyzing in patients post hospitalization with evidence of uh, interstitial lung damage. Um, this is a publication in Chess that basically was talking about the need for these um, COVID clinics. And basically, about it's mentioned, it's mentioned the groups that need to be part of the clinic. So we need uh, not only pulmonologists, but we need psychiatrists. Uh, we need um, the pharmacists who helps. We need a really good PMNR physicians, cardiologists. Depends on what is the syndrome that is affecting the patient the most. So in, in UT, we have established the clinic uh, that we start, that started since May 2020. We have uh, four pulmonologists that we are uh, initially evaluating the patients, but then we have uh, the, the um, collaboration of cardiology, infectious diseases, neurology, psychiatry, PMNR, nephrology, and rheumatology. 
we can do our own testing. Uh, we have a dedicated nurse practitioner uh, and registered nurse and a medical assistant. So the whole team to uh, cooperate with, to the multidisciplinary care of these patients. Uh, this is the statistics of how many patients uh, I'm talking about before uh, Omicron. So about 500 patients seen, 30, we offer telemedicine. Now, for instance, we are doing more telemedicine given the, the new outbreak. 60% um, of our patients have been self-referred. Uh, of course, uh, half of them are post-hospitalization. We have noticed 70% of evidence of interstitial lung damage in the first three months post-hospitalization. But after that, most of the patients improved, not totally, but improved. So again, we are um, started to using some of the antifibrotics, I mean, evaluating the antifibrotic on those patients. Um, we are collecting all the data along with the group for the MD Anderson as well. So in summary, uh, we need still uh, to learn a lot about this virus. Uh, it's definitely an aggressive viral pneumonia. The survivors uh, of the severe disease develop chronic symptoms in up to 80% of the cases. Majority of them improve in the first six months, but we have, again, a significant amount of patients still that we will be, uh, that will be treated. Interstitial lung disease is expected to develop them in many of these, post especially post-hospitalization cases. Um, we need to um, look for uh, how to treat these patients and collect data to improve the care. Thank you so much. I think this, instead of say uh, end, is to be continued. I'm pretty sure we will be talking and dealing with this disease still for a long time. Thank you so much. Good afternoon. This is Abhinash Virk um, sharing my slides. I hope you can see them. And um, so as the, as the previous speaker just said, we have much to learn. That's the same thing with uh, just SARS-CoV-2 and all the variants. We have a lot to learn yet. So I will cover uh, Omicron and what's next and see what, what we know about Omicron so far. Uh, discuss where we are in terms of uh, the variants, uh, where they are globally and also in the US and list what we know about symptoms, diagnosis, prevention, and management so far. Uh, so as we know, uh, these cases uh, globally, uh, COVID-19 cases have continued to increase. This slide was made last week. You can see that it's already um, obsolete because the number of cases have increased uh, both for mortality as well as overall cases. Uh, and when we look at the US, this slide again was made last week and you can see that um, the cases uh, last week, uh, particularly since uh, the week of Christmas, we have had a large number of uh, new cases all over the country. Uh, and essentially at this point, 95% uh, or more of the variants that we have in uh, the United States is Omicron. And I'll go into the details of Omicron in a, in a few seconds. So I just want to uh, level set in regards to variants, because I think people do get confused about variants. And uh, essentially, if you have the schematic of uh, SARS-CoV-2, which has the genetic material, which incl includes the gene for the S protein and the receptor binding protein, and also um, has a nucleocapsid proteins, et cetera. Uh, it's the spike protein, as we know, which is critical for uh, causing the infection. It's a receptor binding protein, uh, that uh, domain that essentially attaches to the uh, angiotensin converting enzyme to, and requires this uh, special protease called temporase to essentially enter the cell. So this has been found to be critical for the pathogenicity of SARS-CoV-2. And this, this work came from uh, MERS and the initial SARS. That's how we know that the spike protein is critical for this uh, infection. What we also know is that these viruses tend to replicate really fast. They uh, have a high yield once they rec replicate. And as they do that, they also have mutational uh, abnormalities. Uh, I sort of equate that to uh, having a photocopier and you are making 100 copies of a page and you'll have some of them that are going to be smudged. You can work with them. You can read what you need to, but some of them are going to be really messed up. So m a lot of these mutations are non-meaningful mutations and don't really impact the pathogenicity of the virus. Whereas 
some of them do in fact change transmissibility, pathogenicity, um, maybe even impact the diagnosis and treatment, but have a limited expanse uh, globally or uh, even in a country such that they are they need to be watched, but they're not at the level where they're going to cause a global event. Variants of concern, on the other hand, have significant mutational abnormalities. Uh, and in this case, of course, we're talking about SARS-CoV-2. We're talking about mutations within the receptor binding domain and the spike protein. Uh, that these changes uh, certainly increase transmissibility and increase pathogenicity and may or may not have an impact on treatment and prevention. And these, when they have spread beyond just a local region, uh, become uh, variants of concern. Um, and thus far, as of today, we have five variants of concern, and you've heard all of them, alpha, uh, which originally uh, came from UK, beta, that was isolated back in May 2020 in South Africa, gamma, and then, of course, most recently, we've been dealing with delta, which originally was identified in India. What we knew about these earlier variants was that alpha did not have much uh, impact on um, effectivity of vaccine or treatments, uh, and but beta, and gamma, and delta did show reduced effectivity against uh, uh, the vaccine effectiveness as well as potentially um, some degree of decrease in monoclonal antibodies. Whereas what we are learning about Omicron is that it does seem to have more impact on both of those. And we'll go into more details in a second. In the US, there is also another uh, definition uh, called the variant of high consequence. This is when you have a variant of concern that is causing increased transmissibility, increased pathogenicity, but you're also now beginning to have impact on your healthcare system such that uh, healthcare employees are out ill and your infrastructure cannot handle the volume of patients that are coming in. So you're not able to really treat these patients and the consequences of uh, kind of maintaining a normal system is getting eroded. Those are variants of high consequence and thus far, we don't have a, an official variant of high consequence. Uh, however, uh, this is being reviewed. So switching over to Omicron, what we know is that, and this, uh, this is from the nexttrain.org where they're, uh, they're categorizing all of the uh, variants that have been identified since the very start of the uh, pandemic. Uh, this slide just essentially shows you uh, the variants since January 2021 all the way through January of 2022. And what we see is that the, the alpha was, um, you know, um, pushed out as the predominant uh, variant. Uh, alpha took over essentially as the predominant variant uh, since essentially middle of 2021. And it seems like now Omicron is beginning to uh, ease uh, Delta out uh, essentially globally. And we'll have to see, uh, you know, how, how many, um, how high and how, what the caseload is going to be. Uh, what I want to show you is that from the very beginning of the, uh, um, of the pandemic, these individual variants have, um, have added mutations over time. And if you look at the left, uh, the y-axis shows you the increasing number of mutations and the y-axis, uh, x-axis is time. And what you're seeing here is that over time, every virus that we are identifying, whether it's a variant of concern, et cetera, is accumulating more and more mutations. Uh, for example, this is a slide from the World Health Organization. What you see here is that uh, the, um, the mutations are shown in these different rectangles. What you see here is that between alpha and Omicron, which is shown here in the dashed line, uh, there's a significant increase in the number of mutations. Some of these mutations, for example, the D614 is in all of them. And this was one of the early ones that was associated with increased transmissibility. And more recently, the E484 is associated with uh, <clears throat> some resistance to uh, antibodies and treatment. So, uh, you know, so we know that these mutations are going to have some impact 
on transmissibility, um, treatment response, uh, and uh, we will have to uh, uh, learn more about these variants. So what do we know about the transmissibility of Omicron? So based on the mutations that we see with, uh, within Omicron, these have increased ACE2 binding and are uh, known to potentially increase transmission. Uh, and there are a number of those mutations that we see in Omicron. And there is that scientific rationale uh, that Omicron is going to transmiss, uh, uh, be more transmissible. Although there are some mutations that may decrease uh, ACE binding, but it seems that more of them are increasing the ACE2 binding and therefore transmission. This is also substantiated by the rapid increase globally of uh, cases. There were a couple of new studies that came out recently, and both of these are um, uh, helpful in understanding another aspect of why transmission may be increasing. Uh, there seems to be higher viral loads within the respiratory tract and therefore the environment. And also there may be some possible um, change in the transmission pattern in terms of being more aerosolized as opposed to uh, just droplet like we knew for uh, the previous variants. And this is one study that came out of Hong Kong that showed that um, depending on how the doors across the hall in a hotel were open, uh, there was risk of uh, infection in the uh, in the room across the across the hall, and it's not really uh, possible with droplet, uh, but more so with aerosolization. So when we look at Omicron, you know, since November 9th, which was the first confirmed case in South Africa. Uh, essentially, within uh, three weeks or less, 80% of South African uh, uh, SARS-CoV-2 was Omicron, and on November 26th, it was declared as the variant of concern, and by then, a number of countries already had it. In the U.S., we had the first travel-associated case on December 1st, and on December 2nd, we had the first um, case that was not associated with international travel. This was an individual that had traveled only to New York City, uh, indicating that uh, Omicron was already here in the United States. And when you compare the Delta versus Omicron, the zero to 95, you know, not the zero to 60 as a car, but a zero to 95% um, uh, proportion of the uh, infections in the country, in the United States, what we saw was that Delta took about 12 weeks for it to go from zero to 95%. But when we look at Omicron, it only took six weeks for, for it to become 95% of infections in the United States. And so it's no surprise that a number of countries already have Omicron present. Uh, many of them uh, are reporting rapid increases, and some may not have detected Omicron specifically, uh, but need to be continued under um, you know, monitoring. In terms of diagnosis, I think it's important to take home that the PCR test that we have will diagnose uh, Omicron very easily. Um, uh, there are some tests that may uh, have decreased uh, sensitivity and those have been uh, you know, identified and pulled off the clinical uh, use, uh, at least in the United States. Uh, in terms of the antigen tests, because of the mutations that are present in the um, spike protein, there is a possibility that the, uh, some of the antigen tests will have lower sensitivity. That lower sensitivity is more likely to occur when the viral load is low. Um, so example, when the symptoms are uh, either asymptomatic or early part of the syndrome where the viral load may be low and therefore you can have false negative testing. If antigen is being used to identify infection, then a uh, uh, recommendation is to repeat that antigen test in about 24 to 48 hours. So the way I kind of look at the antigen test is that if it's positive, it's great. It tells you that you have COVID or tells us as a provider that, you, that the patient has COVID. It's very specific and you can rely on that result. If it's negative and there has been a known exposure um, or there's concern that somebody may have Omicron and it's negative, then there is repeat testing required, whether it's the antigen or it's the PCR to confirm whether somebody has, uh, the, has uh, Omicron. Some of the antigen tests have been identified to have possibly slightly higher 
um, uh, sensitivity compared to others. Currently in the US, there are 43 EUA antigen uh, tests that are approved, but uh, a, a few are possibly better than others. What about symptoms? Uh, what, the symptoms uh, range, uh, and I'll, this is a very illustrative case. This is one of the index cases that we had in the US. The individual had previously had an infection, came back home and had six household members. All six of the household members got infected. Two of them had never had an infection before. So this was the first infection, but the other four had had prior infection and one of them had had a vaccination as well. So in what this study looked at was time to symptoms in the secondary cases and the onset of symptoms was 73 hours. So the range was 33 to 75 hours. Uh, patients who did not previously have uh, an infection had slightly more uh, intense symptoms, and those were cough, joint pain, congestion, fever, and chills. Those that were previously infected, even those uh, that one that had the vaccination, the symptoms were overall milder, um, and these patients did not have any loss of smell or taste. What we learned from this particular um, uh, uh, study was that number one, the incubation compared to Delta is shorter. So it's three days versus four days and five days was what the original one was. Uh, it seems to have high transmissibility. So all of them, uh, all of the household members got it. Previous infection or vaccination does provide some protection. It may not completely prevent an infection, but it, uh, confer some degree of protection uh, and causes a milder infection. And I think that's a really good, important point and substantiated with additional studies. What about severity? So what we know about severity is that uh, the hospitalization and death data tends to lag behind a little bit. Uh, however, all the studies, all the information that we are hearing from the United States as well as from other uh, countries shows that the rates of hospitalization is lower than uh, what we noticed in the previous waves in terms of the ratio of patients who are hospitalized or have died from Omicron compared to say Delta or others. A study from uh, UK showed that hospitalization was approximately half of what the Delta hospitalization rate was. And for those that were vaccinated, the risk of hospitalization was decreased 81% if they'd had three doses and 65% if they had two doses. And this is what we see in the US. So the orange line is uh, hospitalizations for uh, uh, the seven day average uh, of new patients admitted to the hos hospital. And the uh, red line is uh, the average number of cases uh, in the US in the seven day. And what you see is that hospitalizations are increasing, but you know, compared to where we were with uh, Delta, with uh, the previous wave back in January, uh, the proportion is lower than what it was before. This is what we are seeing also from uh, the various uh, epi curves that we are seeing from other countries. This is data from our world uh, in data and also from uh, the UK public publication. What you see is that uh, when you compare to the previous waves of uh, cases, uh, the, the number of hospitalizations are much lower. So the green is the United Kingdom, purple is uh, the U United States, and the pink here is South Africa. And you can see that the South Africa uh, curve uh, decreased very rapidly, and hopefully that'll happen in uh, our country as well. Uh, there are other uh, preliminary information that suggests that uh, severity may be lower with Omicron. So this is an in vitro study that showed that uh, Om Omicron uh, replicates much more uh, efficiently and at a higher rate in the bronchus, in the upper respiratory tract, compared to uh, what they saw in the lung, that in the lung itself, Omicron replicated uh, 10 times lower uh, compared to Delta. Another study, uh, another set of studies looked at animal models and what they found in the animal models was that the infection was less severe, so it was an attenuated infection, and these animals uh, had a lower viral burden, they didn't die uh, as much and they had less weight loss, so suggesting a less severe illness. 
Another study uh, more recently shows that uh, the uh, uh, another preprint study uh, looked at uh, replication within the nasal passages, and they showed that Omicron uh, replicates quite a bit more than Delta. So that could be another reason why there's higher transmissibility. Um, also that uh, this is interesting that Omicron may not necessarily require the proteus, the temporis proteus, for entry into the cells, so suggesting that it could have another way of causing infection in the respiratory cells, which then also suggests that there could be higher uh, uh, transmissibility and potentially infection of the local tissues. And what they also showed was that these viruses, the Omicron-related infections, tend to have less syncytia formation uh, in the tissues. Uh, what about vaccine effectiveness? Uh, vaccine effectiveness. So this is a study from the UK. Uh, it's also preprint, but I just want to share with you what they showed was that there is overall reduction in protection against the Omicron symptomatic disease after two doses. So what I want you to focus is on the salmon color bar. So this is uh, the AstraZeneca vaccine. Uh, and this is Delta compared to Omicron. They did not have enough cases in the Omicron and the AstraZeneca. So, so please ignore that. But basically what they showed was for Delta and AstraZeneca, it was only about 48% uh, uh, vaccine effectiveness in about 15 to 19 weeks. But when you compare Pfizer, so Pfizer was at 72% at that 15 to 92% for Delta. However, the vaccine effectiveness was only about 34% at that same time interval. They compared these patients to those that had boosters. So they looked at those that had the booster and they showed that the booster substantially increased the vaccine effectiveness, both for the AstraZeneca vaccine and also for the Omicron, although the Omicron booster vaccine effectiveness was a little bit lower than it was for Delta, but it was 75% effective. This is also shown in this in vitro study where they were able to show that the antibody levels uh, in people who, were, who had three, uh, who had only two doses of the Pfizer vaccine uh, against the uh, Omicron had very low uh, uh, neutralize, virus neutralization titers, uh, but they increased substantially after the booster. And even in patients who had an infection before when they got a booster, that low uh, virus neutralization really improved quite a bit after uh, the booster that they received. So what this really shows is that prior infection is not going to protect enough uh, in terms of prevention of infection, uh, but the booster, even in vaccinated primary two-dose vaccination or a prior infected person, would improve a protection. Uh, another similar study that looked at neutralization assay this is green lines are those that had two doses of the Pfizer vaccine plus prior infection. Uh, although compared to the original strain, Omicron uh, virus neutralization is lower, significantly lower, uh, but it was much better than if, if uh, somebody just had two doses of the Pfizer vaccine. So again, giving you some evidence that another dose or an infection is going to help in addition to the two doses as the primary. Uh, similar studies have, as this is all press re release that we have seen from uh, Moderna and Pfizer that have indicated substantial increases in neut neutralizing antibodies. And a study uh, specifically looking at uh, j and J booster six to eight months after the single dose showed that the vaccine effectiveness preventing uh, against hospitalization caused by Omicron was 85, 84 to 85 percent. So really good uh, uh, efficacy in regards to hospitalization. Um, well, here, what I want to show you, this is data from New York State where they've been um, uh, monitoring the breakthrough infections. Um, and looking at the vaccine effectiveness, uh, particularly in the gray zone, which is the Omicron, what you see is that uh, overall in, in terms of infection uh, vaccine effectiveness, it's a little lower than 80%, uh, but the risk is much higher in the unvaccinated compared to the vaccinated. 
And in terms of hospitalization protection, that has stayed very, um, very high between 90 to 95%. Uh, but again, risk, is, uh, risk of hospitalization is higher in unvaccinated compared to the vaccinated. What about the fourth dose? We've heard about the fourth dose from Israel. Um, you know, I, I think this is something that we are going to yet learn more about. Uh, certainly giving the fourth dose seems to have increased the antibody level uh, fivefold, and we'll have to see how this, uh, how this uh, relates. In terms of monoclonal uh, uh, antibody effectiveness, what we have learned uh, is that um, the uh, bamlinumab and uh, the Regenikov uh, both have not been, uh, they're not uh, effective against Omicron. Uh, Convalescin plasma partially decreases uh, the um, uh, 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 neutralization. However, uh, the uh, sotrovimab and the new Evershield both have retained neutralization efficacy against uh, um, Omicron. Uh, what, the, what is the future after Omicron? I think the one thing that we have to take away is that there will be more um, variants and what they will look like and how, what, they, what their transmissibility or pathogenicity is, I think is unknown. The one thing that uh, seems to be emerging is that now the SARS-CoV-2 variants seem to have adapted enough so that they can actually go back into animals and come back into humans again. More recently, the data showed that the virus has been identified in uh, mice uh, where it's, uh, uh, it uh, attaches very well to the ACE2 receptor. And the question is, will, this, uh, will there be a new cycle between humans and animals, just like we have for avian influenza? And what, does that, what will that do? And so one can only conjecture that hopefully uh, over time, as people develop more immunity and infections become less severe, it will go away. But I don't know if it will ever go away. It's more likely that it will become more like influenza, where we develop immunity. Uh, but there will be some degree of changing variants. Uh, and we will always have people who don't have immunity, whether it's because they're not vaccinated or because they are uh, immune compromised hosts, et cetera. And particularly if they does develop an animal reservoir, then that will become a, a kind of a source of ongoing uh, uh, epidemics. Uh, hopefully this won't be a worst case scenario where the virus also becomes more lethal, which hopefully uh, will not happen. Um, we're at time, so I will uh, stop here just to say that uh, the aim of vaccination is to obviously reduce all aspects of infection. Uh, however, um, uh, currently most of our uh, vaccine prevention is uh, against the severe disease and the spectrum of transmission is what we are seeing right now. And with that, I will uh, end to say that Omicron is more transmissible, highly infectious, causes milder disease, boosters are needed for protection, and uh, hopefully we will not see too many more uh, serious variants in the future. Thank you, um, Dr. Virk, for a superb talk. And we will ask Dr. Mira to join us for our panel discussion. But while you were talking, a couple of things arose from all the questions that we have. I think we're up to about 65 questions. Is um, first of all, could you comment on the availability of monoclonals for treatment of COVID-19? I know that they're available, but with markedly restricted supply. Yes, so uh, monoclonal antibodies are a very restricted supply in the United States. Uh, they are uh, particularly Evishield is uh, very, very restricted and is being uh, limited to severely immunocompromised individuals. Um, and uh, Sotrovimab is a little bit more available, but uh, certainly, you know, will be uh, challenging over the next few weeks. And then Dr. Virk, can you refine a bit about the fourth dose of vaccines? And specifically, I think the place to address that would be among the immunocompromised host or transplant patients, if you could comment. Yeah, so I think that's a really important point that I, uh, we are finding that patients and providers are a little bit confused 
about the doses that immunocompromised individuals received back in August. So I want to highlight that for immune compromised individuals, the dose that was approved in August was an additional dose. It was dose number three. And the reason why it looked like a booster, looked like a booster, is because by the time it was approved in August, many of the immune compromised individuals had had the vaccine many months ago. Uh, so it seemed like, oh, that was a booster. That's actually the number three dose in a series of three primary series in immune compromised individuals. All immune compromised individuals should now receive the booster five months after that last dose in August. So essentially all immune compromised individuals should be getting four doses as opposed to the non-immune compromised uh, are three for the third as the booster. And then just in that vein, are you aware, I am not, of an agreed upon protective anti-spike level that one could test to see whether or not they are protective. I, I believe we don't know that, but Dr. Mira or Dr. Ver, are you aware of any breakpoint? No, we, we don't. And that, that is unfortunately uh, uh, an issue that hopefully we'll have some answers to. We still don't have a proper correlate, to, uh, correlate of protection in relation to the antibodies. Yeah. Now, Dr. Mira, there are quite a few questions on um, post-COVID syndrome. Um, two um, of them were, one, how do you separate steroid withdrawal from those individuals who are hospitalized and are having post-ICU syndromes and then possibly steroid withdrawal involvement? And then another question was, could you refine a bit if you have any char um, characteristics that you use in your designation medical center for antifibrotic agents? Okay. Yeah, I was just, I was answering some of the questions and I was ready to answer that one in the gastrosteroid. <laughs> I mean, it's one of the more important differential diagnoses. Um, so first uh, for the physicians that have been taking care of these patients. So in general, trying to prevent that, uh, we should not use steroids more than uh, 10 days on these patients first. So we use uh, the six milligrams per day based on the initial trial in patients who are not intubated. The patient who requires uh, mechanical ventilation, we go to 20 milligrams daily for five days and 10 milligrams daily for five days. Uh, following the meta-analysis that was published uh, yes. in, in summer after we were using for six months the six milligrams, but we don't do above that. Uh, even if the patient is receiving the, this high, higher dose of steroids, then we, we don't use tocilizumab or I mean, any other medication that can affect more the, immuno, the, the, the immune condition. Because um, what we've seen is that the, I mean, when they stay longer in the, in the intensive care unit, these patients are dying after a resistant infections. I mean, many other problems related with the use of high doses of steroids. So that is one, one message. But unfortunately, I think probably even uh, mostly in the first surge, we have many patients that were treated for a long time with the steroids and they're coming uh, to the clinic with uh, the findings suggestive of um, a steroid uh, induced problem. How I recognize that, I mean, patients, uh, one of the first patients I had, that's the one I showed the CT, the second CT, she came uh, with no new diagnosis of diabetes that she didn't have before. She came unable to walk for severe muscle weakness. And when we reviewed the CT, we saw improvement in the CT and the pulmonary function tests were consistent more with a chest a, a weakness more than really a damage of the, of the gas exchange. So we can recognize that as a pulmonologist. So all these findings are consistent more with the myopathy related with the uh, long, term, long, long use of steroids. So it's basically the same approach that we do with any patient uh, that is using high doses of steroids for any reason. And it's the same that we, are, we need to um, apply in patients uh, post COVID. If that's the case, uh, the first thing is, is slow down the, I mean, taper off the steroids. Uh, and um, sometimes I need uh, to talk to the endocrinologist to help the health it, because some patients are receiving so high doses that they can develop adrenal, ins adrenal insufficiency. Otherwise, this and start aggressive rehabilitation. The PMNR 
doctors, I think they are playing a really important role in post-COVID yeah. patients because they um, they can approach not only the physical part, but they can help with the mental part as well. And um, the rehabilitation is, is really important. We have been, I haven't seen patients now for more than a year. And uh, thanks God, most of them after like six months of aggressive rehabilitation, they start finally uh, feeling better. But the way to, to differentiate is the history, of course, for how long the patient was on steroids. And then uh, physically, if there is a clear myopathy, this is more likely related with the steroids. Now, there are many primary care individuals who are asking questions. Can you address what type of workup you think should be done prior to sending a patient to a long haul or a long COVID, post COVID type of center? What type of basic workup should be done post hospitalization before referral to you? Oh, that's a pretty good question. Yes. Um, first is the time. I mean, the patient is, um, many patients come like within the first three months of the diagnosis. If it's, if it's too close to the initial diagnosis, um, I think probably it's still the primary care can watch the patient. If it's after three months and it's still the patient is complaining of a specific symptom, uh, again, go to the syndromes. If it's more related with a um, brain, like a headache, lack of concentration. So, so then, I mean, I don't know if it's basic, but the, the neurologists are in agreement in these cases, do a brain MRI, do all these kind of tests. So probably refer the patient. Um, if it's uh, more related with uh, muscle disease, then be sure they are not missing uh, some connective tissue disorder. So order the best, the ANA, the ENA, the, the CK. So all these kind of differential diagnosis. Uh, if, if it's more like a fibromyalgia picture, so then look out for rule out connective tissue disorder and then um, definitely send the patient. If it's a persistent shortness of breath, echocardiogram, just be sure if the patient develop pulmonary emboli, be sure there's no developing pulmonary hypertension, uh, or is a new diagnosis of heart failure. Um, I will do always pulmonary function tests, and if it's possible, a chest CT, just to see if there is definitely establishment of chronic lung disease. Um, I, that would be like, the, those are the more common symptoms, but I will say mostly is the period of time. Uh, many of these patients after three months, they even don't come back because they feel fine. They say, I find fine, I don't, I, yeah. don't want, I don't need to come back, I don't, I don't need to do more tests. So I would say that. Yeah. And then there, there's questions as to the difference between Delta and Omicron in the incidence of long COVID. And I think it may be too early for us to say <laughs> we know the answer to that by your definition of 12 months, but there were several questions on that. So could you also address that? Uh, it's, it's, it's early. I haven't probably seen um, yet patients with, I mean, the established diagnosis of post-COVID uh, now because we are just having the acute episodes. But I can see, because one of the questions uh, in, this, in the panel was, what is the difference in, or what is the risk for post-COVID if the patient is fully vaccinated? I had, uh, because now we have many, many of us, many of the, of the, of the medical, uh, I mean, the, the health system providers uh, are having positive uh, tests or yes. positive or sick, and we are full vaccinated. In my institution, for instance, is we can award you we are not full vaccinated. So it's, 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 there is no option. Um, we, I mean, I haven't seen, but I don't, I don't, I'm not sure about any publication. I have, but I haven't seen too many patients with significant symptoms if they were vaccinated. But there, there was a publication that showed a lower risk of post-COVID infection uh, in vaccinated individuals. And I think the other thing I would suggest is that uh, I agree with uh, Dr. Mira that um, it's too early for us to really know about the post-COVID and uh, Omicron, but, uh, but we also know that post-COVID is a little bit more common in patients who had severe COVID. And, and so if we, if we think of it from that perspective that most of these patients are having not, in, and it's not everybody, but more, many of these patients are having milder, shorter duration of symptoms, perhaps their risk of long COVID is also going to be lower uh, with Omicron. But again, this is yet to be seen. Mm -hmm. um, Dr. Virk, can you comment on, you mentioned the possibility that Omicron may be aerosolized. Can you comment on um, aerosolization versus droplet 
for Omicron and the type of masks that should be used um, during this time period? Um, so that was the one study that I showed you uh, that was from a Hong Kong hotel study where they looked at uh, possible aerosolization. So there is some, um, there's that one study and I think, you know, we don't know yet fully, uh, it hasn't been replicated at other places or in, with other methodologies to see if it truly does aerosolize, it's a theory. Um, but what we are also seeing is that uh, surgical masks uh, seem to be very protective against uh, Omicron or Delta. And thus far, we are recommending surgical masks for all of our staff um, and uh, the N95 if they're doing, um, you know, some aerosolizing pr producing uh, procedures. I think the one thing that I would say is that um, cloth masks, especially those that are only two layer or gaiters that tend to be knitted, uh, shouldn't really not, I, I mean, they, they're not gonna be as effective. So I would not recommend those currently with the Omicron. There's a question here as to whether or not vaccination improves long COVID syndrome. And the way I would reframe that is that vaccination very clearly decreases the likelihood of one getting severe COVID disease. Mm -hmm. And it's more prevalent among those that have severe COVID disease to develop long COVID. Would you agree with that, Dr. Mira? Yes, I think, I think Dr. Birk already mentioned that. So I think that's the explanation we, we are not seeing uh, too many patients who at least know with the severe post-COVID that was described after the first, even the second surge. Because after the second surge in, 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 in summer, we started having more vaccinated patients. And uh, now we see that because the disease is less severe, because it's true, 80% of patients that are hospitalized are the ones who develop chronic disease. Outpatient is only about 35% of them. So definitely with vaccination, the risk will be much lower. But I think the question, I'm, I'm wondering if the question was asked that if somebody has post-COVID syndrome already and they were not oh, vaccinated, vaccinated, and um, if they get a vaccine, would their post-COVID symptoms go down? I, uh, I don't know. <laughs> I, I don't know that one. <laughs> Mm. I, I, some, I seem to remember something about it, but I can't go to you on a paper right now on that. But I, I think there was, uh, there was some paper on that specific question. Yeah, no, I, I, I don't know if that would be. Can, can both of you comment on the pediatric population? We are seeing more Omicron in the younger age group. Um, can you comment as to why? And we don't see pediatrics here at Mayo Clinic Florida, but there's a question as what is the prevalence of long COVID in the pediatric population? Dr. Ferk, do you want to go first? Yeah, so I, I think the number of cases right now, when we look at uh, children compared to uh, earlier last year and now, there does seem to be a slightly higher rate of children uh, getting the infection Omicron and also getting hospitalized with Omicron. And uh, I think uh, part, part of it is related to the fact that the percent uh, of the children, uh, you know, five to 15 that have been vaccinated are not that high. So between 11 to 15, it's about 50%. Uh, and between five to uh, 11, it's uh, only about 25, 30%. So A, they're susceptible. So there are a larger number of kids that are more susceptible compared to the adults. And secondly, they, you know, they are, they have been back in school, uh, you know, for the last weeks, etc. And there have been a lot of social activities. So I think that those are kind of multiple reasons why we may be seeing slightly higher uh, rates of infection in children. Dr. Mira? Yes, no, I, to be honest, I don't have experience with kids. I know about the statistics, but we don't, I don't see any, any children. So the, the Texas Children is totally different for what I'm. <laughs> uh, it's <laughs> like my said in Florida. I don't want to say anything because uh, I, I, do I, wanna, don't, I don't have experience. Yeah. Okay. I do want to comment that MMWR this week did report that among, in, among those under the age of 18 have a significantly increased risk of diabetes. 
of which is um, important for us to be able to monitor for. And they also show that it does occur in higher age groups, but it was predominantly in those under the age of 18. And I think the window of time was one to two months post um, having COVID. Now, yeah. both of you uh, are like me, um, are very familiar with influenza. There are questions regarding the combination of fluona, is it worse than that of COVID alone, the combination of influenza and COVID. You're giggling, Dr. Virk, so. <laughs> yes, I've actually done a few, uh, yeah, I've had a few discussions about this. So uh, firstly, at the winter of 2020 and 2021, so uh, last winter, we had very little influenza because everyone was masking, everyone was social distancing, and uh, there was limited social gathering, et cetera. So we saw very little influenza. This year, influenza is already increasing in many states in the United States, and I'm sure at other uh, in other countries as well, there's increase in uh, seasonal influenza because we are masking less and uh, we have more social activities, uh, et cetera. Uh, we have already seen patients that have had uh, both influenza and uh, COVID. And, you know, uh, the question is whether a co-infection is going to be more severe or not. We, we have not seen that uh, so far, but it's early in the influenza season. Uh, I do think that for the um, immune compromised host, or the elderly patients who are already most susceptible to all people with chronic lung disease, et cetera, who are already most susceptible to severe lung disease with these viruses are probably going to have a more severe infection. The other thing that we've noticed in the United States this, uh, this season is that uh, influenza vaccination is about 7% behind last year. So people are more susceptible this year because they are also less vaccinated. So I think we will see both of those. And the third thing that the final thing I wanted to say about this is that uh, here at Mayo Clinic, our testing strategy last year, as well as this year for the winter was that if anybody presents with influenza-like illness, fever, chills, headache, et cetera, we are testing them for influenza and um, uh, COVID-19. And if they have the risk factors for RSV, meaning that they're immune compromised, et cetera, we're testing them for all three of them if they're coming in with those uh, because it has implications for treatment, it has implications for isolation. And um, you know, so uh, those are just a few points I wanted to make. Yes, we are doing the same here at Mayo Clinic Florida, as you just described, and we are um, very much strongly encouraging not just COVID vaccination, but influenza vaccination. Dr. Mira, did you want to comment what University of Texas may be doing? No, it's the same. We have the same role, the same for the for the for us, we the same. We don't, we don't have the vaccine, we cannot work. And that was that's the campaign it started in September. It was even sooner than normally for the vaccination. Uh, and I'm not aware either about combined, I mean, at least not in other units, like a, a, a case of like IRDS or severe associated with both at the same time. We are testing everybody with the whole viral panel, yes, plus the COVID, but I haven't seen cases or combination. Um, Dr. Fur, can you comment a bit more about natural immunity versus that of vaccination? There is a question um, regarding if somebody has adequate antibody levels, do they need to get the boosters? I believe that we already alluded to the fact that we don't know what antibodies are protective. And I would be recommending that they do get, quote, the booster, or if they are immunocompromised, they've completed the third dose series. But maybe you could reiterate that to avoid any confusion that may still exist. Right. So, well, uh, as I showed in the slides that, uh, especially against Omicron, uh, just natural infection itself is not enough in terms of protection. And we also know that natural infection related protection does not last long term. Uh, so three months, maybe six months, but no more than that. Uh, and also based on the studies that I just showed you in terms of just the increase in the antibody levels, but also for the fact that uh, clinically we're seeing a better protection in people who have had the third dose, uh, that infection itself alone without your boosters 
is not going to be enough to protect against Omicron. There's um, a question as uh, does a recipient who receives monoclonal antibody have a decreased innate antibody response because of the presence of those antibodies? Um, so, um, you know, this is not very well studied. Uh, when the vaccines were originally approved, uh, automatically, we had, we as in, uh, you know, the whole country and others globally had recommended to wait 90 days before we vaccinated for the concern that there may be some interaction there. However, more recently, because uh, also looking at the kind of the half-life of some of these medications, uh, it is reasonable that maybe we should be doing vaccinations less than 90 days. Uh, and that's one of the reasons why CDC recently changed the recommendation that if you're giving a monoclonal antibody on a kind of a prophylactic basis versus treatment basis, uh, then you could give the vaccine a month after prophylaxis, whereas you still want to keep the 90 days after the monoclonal when it's given for treatment. And the other rationale for waiting the 90 days is that we know that the natural immunity is also going to protect people for the first 90 days. So, so you know, so there isn't much of a concern that if somebody had an infection that they have to wait for 90 days to get the vaccine. It's also to um, stress that the innate immunity or even vaccinations have more to do than just antibody levels that involves the CD45 and T cells. Mm -hmm. And that's, they play a very critical role involved in this. Um, and, and, and to add to what you just said, uh, I think there's, uh, you know, as we know, the immune system is so complex, you know, there's the T cells, there's priming, there's, uh, you know, long term memory cells. Uh, there is more data that's coming out suggesting that the booster, you know, again, uh, based on what we know from other vaccines as well, is uh, helpful in increasing that T cell immunity as well. There's a question regarding vaccination in those individuals who have long COVID. Do you hesitate doing that, Dr. Mira? Is there any reason that you're seeing somebody that is, let's say, 90 days out post hospitalization meets the criteria for long COVID? Is there a reason that you would hold off giving them the influenza vaccine? No, 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 no. We always recommend, we always ask respectfully. <laughs> If the patient wants to be vaccinated, because you know, still some patients don't want, but we always encourage them for vaccination, for for the whole. Uh, I mean, uh, influenza and COVID. Okay. Um, give me a moment. I. Is there any reason to be giving nasal vaccines or nasal treatments? I'm not aware of a nasal vaccine that's FDA approved for use okay. in the United States. And I'm not aware of any treatment that is nasal oriented. I know that mm, I have not seen a study, but I know that individuals may use steroids, nasal steroids for people who have lost smell during the acute phase of the disease, but that's not trial tested as a recommendation. Are, and are you know, any of you want to comment on that? No. <laughs> no. Okay. Um, and then how long does the Pfizer and Moderna confer their duration of efficacy? Are we aware of that information? When does the vaccine wane in a normal host? Um, so, um, what we are learning is that it, when we talk about veining immunity, it is veining uh, against protecting infection, just getting an infection, many mild symptoms, but it's still holding its protection against uh, hospitalization and severe disease. That has continued. Now we are a year into the vaccination since December of 2020, that that protection against hospitalization and severe disease is holding in that, um, you know, 80, now with the Omicron around 80%, 90% in that, in that frame. Uh, and based on the previous studies that were done, uh, including studies from here, um, that the 
about six, seven months is when your immunity does go down. Uh, but, you know, and th that's where the hopefully the booster will help with the longevity of these uh, of this protection as well. Dr. Mira, would you like to comment on that at all? No, totally agree. You totally agree. Okay. So, um, there's an, another question in regards to the pathophysiology of pulmonary long COVID and stopping anticoagulation. Could you readdress um, the pathophysiology yeah. so what, and, so and the a, use of anticoagulants? Yes, no. So the, um, the anticoagulation was highly um, used and recommended, especially in the first and the second surge. Uh, following that, we didn't have, or we don't have enough evidence that definitely helps with the inflammatory process, except the patient who clearly have indication for clear episode. Now, passing that event, when the patient comes to our clinic after three months, they say that the patient required to be anticoagulated for pulmonary emboli or DVT during hospitalization. Basically, we are following the same rules uh, for uh, pulmonary emboli. Like uh, it was provoked emboli associated with the disease, three months of anticoagulation could consider it, is considered enough. You can probably consider six months for some patients, but if you are, if we are considering con continue the anticoagulation because of the post COVID itself, no, there is not evidence of that. And if it's related with the risk for lung fibrosis uh, either. So basically, uh, no, there is not indication that continued anticoagulation will decrease that or they are clearly indicated. Now, the other point, and I know because even some uh, pulmonologists have been doing that, is the, uh, not, not only for the lung disease, but the inflammatory state that they offer maybe low dose of aspirin or even anticoagulation. For these patients, uh, there is no clear evidence. I never use more than three months when the patient were started on it after hospitalization. I don't know if Dr. Birch has any other. I agree with what you said. I'm going to give each of you one minute for a summation of what you want our wonderful audience to walk away with. I'll let you go first, Dr. Ferg. Well, uh, <clears throat> I think Omicron, um, unfortunately, just one of the many variants that we've had so far. Um, I, I think, unfortunately, none of us can look at the crystal ball and say what the future is going to hold, except to say that we will have more variants and hopefully um, they will be less severe as we go f into the future, particularly if people are more and more uh, protected with vaccination, hopefully this will become a, um, a milder and unimportant disease. For my part, I think it's for the, we don't know what else is coming. Uh, I hope it's with the incident or the prevalence of the amount of vaccinated people, we have less chronic damage. Uh, but still, I think we we need to learn how we will work with the chronic sequela related with the disease. And in general, uh, I think we all of us we are doing a great job uh, working against this, and we need to continue encourage the people to get vaccinated. I agree. I want to thank both you, Dr. Ferk and Dr. Mira, for phenomenal talks. I want to thank everybody for being present with us today. And again, Mayo Clinic and all of us extend our gratitude to you for the care and dedication that you are rendering to your patients, as well as to your colleagues daily. Again, thank you. And please entertain joining us on future webinars. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.